Our next speaker is, is Ravenna Soest. She's a doctoral researcher at the University of Luxembourg and also a consultant of the IOM's Global Migration Data Analysis Center, so the GIMDAC, uh, where she has recently co-authored two studies focusing on migration forecasts. In her first session, Ravenna will provide a comprehensive overview of the main predictive models that are currently in use, so forecast, scenario studies, and early warning and alert systems. Ravenna is the only one today who actually has the pleasure to be uh, able to present for 20 minutes because she's really offering us a foundation uh, so we can all speak from sort of the same level of knowledge for the rest of the day. So she will spend um, 20 minutes presenting and then we have 10 minutes for Q&A. But please feel free to write your questions in the chat whenever they occur to you and we'll be sure to, to organize them accordingly. So Ravenna, it is my pleasure uh, to hand the virtual podium over to you. Um, hello, thank you very much for the introduction, Julia. Um, I hope um, you can hear and see me well enough. I would have loved to be in Vienna, but um, this is the times that we're living in, and I'm happy. I'm happy to particip participate. Um, so, today I'm going to speak to you about um, the different approaches that exist to anticipate migration. Um, my goal is really to lay groundwork for the follow-up presentations that will take place throughout the day. Um, so, I will focus specifically on an overview of approaches and emphasize the relative strengths and weaknesses that come from them. Um, so that when the migration um, snapshots and the predictions that we will see later on in the day will become more, um, more intuitive relative to each other. Um, I will speak for about 20 minutes, as Julia said, and there's time uh, for some questions or clarifications should you have any um, in the end. So feel free to, to write anything in the chat or just, or just afterwards. Um, okay, so interest in migration forecasts and migration scenarios is clearly growing. What you see here on the screen is um, a result from a systematic literature review that we conducted last year at GIMDAC, um, and that shows the number of forecasts and scenario studies that were published each year since the 1940s approximately. So the number of fo in for the forecasts are shown in blue and the scenario studies are shown in yellow. And what you can clearly see is that the trend is going upward. So we're not the only ones here right now who are interested in, in future migration. Um, over the last years and really decades, though, the amount of approaches has been growing tremendously, and there is now a great diversity. So it is helpful to think of these um, different approaches to belong to either of three groups, um, which would be first, early warning systems, uh, second, forecasts or statistical models, and lastly, uh, foresight. You can understand them, um, for example, as ranging from a very short predictive horizon to one that goes to the medium term and to the long term, ultimately. Um, however, all these approaches are meant to help us anticipate migration, but there are fundamental differences that are really important um, to understand. For example, these uh, approaches differ in how they conceptualize migration. Some of the approaches that I'm going to speak about, uh, for example, draw on causal theories of migration. They speak about drivers um, and push and pull factors, for example, whereas others um, are agnostic in that kind of sense. The approaches also differ in what time frames they're looking at. So I've shown that a little bit, but they can really, really range from a few days or weeks up to a few decades in the most long term. Um, and approaches to anticipate migration also vary in what type of data are required, for example, and what and who is involved most in the production. So some might, for example, draw on very comprehensive administrative data sets, whereas others are more reliant on expert opinion and a very diverse pool of stakeholders. And of course, all these approaches differ fundamentally in how they treat uncertainty. Um, I'm not gonna go very much into this because there is a talk by Jakob Bija coming up who will provide you with much more detail on that. 
Um, so now I'm going to go uh, one by one through the fundamental, through one of the, through the most common approaches, let's say, and give you a little bit more um, background and details about them. So let's start with the early warning system. Um, as the European Commission's new pact on migration and asylum that was just released last week really showed is that early warning system has become so central to the European Commission's thinking about uh, migration management. And so I, I just brought um, that extract here from this new pact. It says, um, a structured migration management mechanism is necessary with real-time monitoring and early warning. The EU should be moving from a reactive mode to one based on preparedness and anticipation. So what does that really mean and how does an early warning system function? Um, as I said, early warning systems function on the short term. They really range from a few weeks to usually a few months, up to one or two years at most. Um, early warning systems draw on a constant supply of information um, about migration trends and potential drivers. Um, as such, an early warning system could almost be more understood as uh, migration monitoring or even now casting, as you will hear by André Grüger later, later today also. The type of information can be both qualitative or quantitative, depending on the system. For example, um, it could be a network of field workers that are stationed across the world in interesting regions and that provide reports um, about changes that they observe. This is, for example, done in the IOM's displacement um, tracking matrix. But it can also very well be quantitative. In that case, it could be, for example, in the timely information on border apprehensions, or it could be satellite data, or it could be more innovative data sources such as social media data or search engine results, as we will also hear. Um, by combining all these different data sources, um, early warning systems allow to identify um, imminent migration surges and potential trigger events. Mm, early warning systems have been mostly practitioner driven. Um, and so they focus on humanitarian migration. Um, as we've seen, for example, with the uh, EU Migration Pact, the goal is really to facilitate operational planning, allocate resources, and therefore become more active in, in reacting to, to uh, new events. And because of the relatively short time horizon, they're also um, presenting a relatively high accuracy, which is um, attractive to use it. The second, the second approach that I want to present are statistical and model-based forecasts. They're more uh, functioning on the midterm, so we speak about months, but also a few years, maybe 10 years. Um, and really there are two approaches um, that are key in this, uh, in this field. One are econometric regressions, and the other one are time series extrapolations. And they're quite technical and what is most usually referred to when we speak about forecasts in a common sense. Um, but there's one key difference between these two that is really important, and that is the use of explanatory factors. So in econometric regressions that are used to forecast migration, um, so-called explanatory factors are, are drawn on that are usually taken from causal theories of migration and that explain why people move. This could, for example, include um, the distance between two countries. It can include income differentials between two countries, uh, labor market uh, situations, or also um, historical ties, uh, shared common languages, and so on. So each of these factors in an economic forecast is uh, quantified and then used to uh, forecast migration into the future. In contrast, there's also time series extrapolation, which do not use any sort of, uh, any sort of explanatory variables, at least in a simple version. But instead, the only type of data they draw on are historical time series data. So here in the bottom right of my presentation, you see one example 
um, that I've been recently working on with my colleagues from GymDAC in Berlin. Um, it's just to show that on the left side, you see a, a thick black line, which are historic lows that have been observed. And on the right hand side, you see a projection that is based solely on the, on the historical time series data. So how it works is that it recognizes some sort of trend or pattern and projects it into the future. Um, the, the shaded area that you see around them, there are uh, prediction intervals and shows some sort of uncertainty spans that go along with that um, extrapolation. Um, let's go to the third approach that is commonly used. And these are expert and survey-based forecasts. Again, there are two uh, most important ones, I would say. One is the migration attention survey. It basically works by going into a country where you have potential immigrants and asking um, those people about their desires, plans, or preparation to immigrate. For example, um, the Gallup World Core data is widely available, available and has a great comparability um, and asks these types of questions. Of course, it is important uh, to keep in mind that any type of intention cannot be translated one-to-one -one in an actual action uh, to emigrate and do that migration process. However, there are some recent papers that show that an intention and especially preparations are good predictors of actually migration behavior. Um, another type of expert uh, and survey forecast relies more on um, a group of experts, and that's, for example, the Delphi survey. Susanna Melda is going to speak about that more in, in a few minutes. Um, and the idea behind the Delphi survey is to collect the estimates of a group of experts and by doing that in a systematic way, reduce individual bias and sort of distill a consensus of experts that creates a more reliable forecast in the end. Um, these type of expert um, estimates can be used to complement statistical forecasts, like for example, the time horizon, the time series extrapolations that I've shown previously, but it can also be used, for example, when data is scared about specific, about specific flows or when um, migration flow data are very volatile and therefore statistical models fail to, fail to make accurate predictions. Lastly, we're moving to the most long-term of the approaches. This is foresight. Um, and there are different types of foresight analysis, like horizon scanning, for example, or trends analysis. But the most commonly used in migration in the migration field is scenario building. Um, scenario building is really a, a long-term strategic type of approach um, that's usually based on group work. Uh, diversity of stakeholders come together, for example, experts from academia, policymakers, and migrants themselves. And they come together and in some sort of discursive process and map out contextual factors that will contribute to future migration. In the end, they come up with a narrative output, a qualitative output of what is scenarios. So they present not one future, but a field of possible futures. Um, in that sense, scenarios and foresight in generally helps in thinking about assumptions, um, helps to challenge assumptions, and highlight the, complex, uh, the complexities and uncertainties that are surrounding um, long-term developments of future migration. Here, for example, is um, an extract from a scenario workshop from the International Migration Institute from 2011 where you see where participants group different factors really along two axes. One axis is how certain are we about these developments, and the other axis is what has really the greatest impact on migration. And on the upper right-hand side, there is a, there is a red circle, and it, 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 shows one, um, it shows one of the factors that I think is really a good example of how foresight, for example, differs from statistical modeling. It says EU fragmentation and sub-regional block formation. So this is a factor that has been considered very important for the future of migration to the European Union by the participants, but it would be typically something that's very difficult to model um, in, for example, econometric regressions or time series extrapolations. So this is the type of 
the type of arguments that can be discussed in, in foresight exercises. So this is just a sort of wrap up and uh, last comparison of the three approaches that I presented. Uh, just to remind you, there were early warning system on the first, um, as a first group of approaches. They were relatively short term, a few weeks to a few months. They can draw on a, qual a qualitative or quantitative information and can mix them easily. Um, and they have a focus on mostly humanitarian migration. Second, we looked at forecasts and statistical modeling with a midterm sort of outlook. Um, they usually um, mostly draw on quantitative data sources and then model regular migration flows, such as labor, family, or student migration. And lastly, we looked at foresight um, as an approach to anticipate migration with the most long-term strategic approach um, and a qualitative narrative output. Um, all types of migration flows can be considered in foresight exercises. Um, so just to maybe uh, launch, launch the discussion and make a quick, a quick uh, conclusion here is, um, what can we then, given all these different approaches, realistically expect from migration forecasts? Um, one thing that is very clear is that there is no universally preferred approach. It really depends on the purpose of the exercise or of the forecast to tailor to what is needed. There are, of course, also trade-offs in terms of uh, resources, time, people, data requirements, time horizons, and so on, that need to go into the thinking about which forecast is the most adapted to us. And lastly, it is really important that uh, forecast producers and forecast users work together and in a discussion produce something that is adapted and is also understood as what it can offer because every approach has some things it can show and others which it simply cannot provide. Um, so thank you. That is it from my side so far. Um, I'm looking forward to any questions that you might have, any clarifications. Thank you so much, Ravenna. That was a really excellent overview, uh, very comprehensive, mm -hmm. very to the point. Um, I think we all learned a lot, so thanks thanks for this presentation. We have a few questions already that came in, which my fantastic team is helping mm -hmm. organize here. The first question is from Arvid Zeng Norin from the Swedish Migration Agency. And uh, he's asking, whether you've only investigated approaches to migration forecasts in research or whether you've also looked into the prognosis papers presented by migration agencies or ministries in different countries that are normally not conducted as research, so they don't have generally established, established methods. I assume the question is in regard to, you mentioned in the beginning you did a systematic literature review, um, so which mm -hmm. kind of papers you looked at. Um, mm -hmm. Do you prefer to answer that, or should I give you the next few ones as well? Um, maybe I answer directly. Great. Okay, yeah. Um, so we conducted the systematic literature re review last year, which is also available and which can I share in the chat. And the focus in the systematic literature re review was on the one hand, really on scenario studies. And in the scenario studies, we looked at um, at both academic and practitioner-driven literature. Um, scenarios are a mostly practitioner-driven methodology, so we actually had more um, studies coming from, from governments or from, from the EU, for example. But for the more quantitative forecast, so the statistical type of modeling, we focused on academic literature and did not take into account very much of the practitioner um, approaches in that field. Excellent. Thank you very much. We also have another question from Zurjit Singh, a PhD student, um, and he's asking whether you see the possibility of using the machine learning techniques in predicting the immigration flows well in advance. Uh, machine learning has many merits over the standard econometric approaches. He says. Uh, so we will be speaking about machine learning um, actually in the next few presentations, um, but maybe you also have a comment, Ravenna. Yeah, I mean, I think um, the following presentation will make that much clearer. But uh, generally speaking, there is a great potential also for machine learning, and it has been increasingly used. 
let's say. There have been a few projects and they're developing greatly. But um, in, in its foundation, there is nothing against it, speaking against it. So absolutely, yes, it can be used. Super. So, Sujit, if you hang on, then you will uh, have the pleasure to listen to André Gröger, who will touch upon this yes. uh, this approach in, in more detail. We have another question from uh, Marie Vandres from the Federal Planning Bureau of Belgium. And she says that econometric approaches or time series extrapolation are able to take what has already been observed into account. But how do we take uh, not yet observed events into account. So, for example, uh, climate migrants. So, how do we how do we build scenarios um, around that? Yeah, that is a very good question because question because it is really the fundamental difficulty I think of of migration forecasting. Migration has very little regularity, so looking only at the past is unlikely to give us a sufficient uh, picture for the future. Um, and so I think if you if you're interested, for example, in in more recent changes, um, you would need to move away a little bit from the purely statistical modeling and take into account, for example, expert opinion, as has been done in Bayesian framework, for example, by Jack, who's also going to speak um, in just a few minutes, um, or move even further into the foresight exercise. But as I said, it will be a trade-off in terms of certainty. So you can take into account these sort of events, but they will reduce the certainty of, of the forecast, especially when you look at longer time horizons. Excellent. Uh, so there is another question from Alessandra Venturini, and she's asking about the problem of the quality of the data. So um, she says that south-south migration is not well counted. What can we do? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's true. Many, many migration data are a difficult field, let's say. And so again, my um, my approach would be either to look for alternative approaches or combine approaches, combine data sources. Um, for example, I spoke about the Delphi study, which is usually one approach that can be used when data could be scarce, for example. Or another example would be the type of social media data or satellite data that can be drawn on, for example, when administrative data sources are really scarce. Um, so I think the challenge is really to become creative and from the diversity of approaches that we have, pick the ones that we can use and use either one of them or combine them ideally. Very interesting. Uh, Ravenna, I actually also have a question. So um, at yeah. the European Migration Network in Austria, we consulted other uh, European Migration Network member states, so EU member states, um, to get a sense whether migration forecasts are used across the European Union. And we received uh, responses from 22 EU member states who responded to our survey, and of those, of those, 11 reported that they do use forecasting methods at the national level. So half of those that responded reported that they do use it. And so one of the interesting findings uh, for me was that almost three quarters of those use risk analysis or early warning systems, and only one third use sort of the longer term methods. So only one third go beyond two years. Um, now, you explained that the, the, with the different models, there are different, you use them depending on the policy approach, but do you see any methodological reason behind the fact that most member states uh, are interested in the immediate to short term rather than, than the longer term? Mm -hmm. um, well, yeah, this is exactly what I wanted to point out in, in my last slide, on my last slide. So there are obviously trade-offs between the different advantages and time horizons. And one of them, obviously, is the certainty that's attached to forecasts. So when you compare, for example, a foresight approach to an early warning approach, then the accuracy and the certainty that you can take from them is very different. Um, of course, there could be reasons to be found in, in the political economy and election cycles and so on that you can speculate about. But I don't think there is a myth purely methodological reason to prefer one approach over the other. There is no universally better approach in that sense. It really, really depends on the purpose of that forecast. But if 
certainty is a key factor, then a short time horizon and therefore early warning systems seem preferable. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, so there are more questions coming in from the participants, which I'm very pleased about. Um, there is one question by Dina Deza, who is asking, first of all, uh, says thank you very much for a lucid and insightful presentation. The question is, where would you place probabilistic models of catastrophe risks um, that can provide the basis for displacement risk models? Mm -hmm. um, so the, distinguished, the distinguishing be between deterministic and probabilistic forecast methods is not something I went to in this presentation, but they can kind of cut through the different approaches. For example, a few of the ones that are presented could be presented both as deterministic or as probabilistic. Um, I think in the foresight field, the uncertainty is something that's built into the method. There is no question about that. But for everything that's in the midterm, there's a question for a researcher or for someone who wants to use a migration forecast, whether they want to have it in a deterministic or a probabilistic fashion. Um, in my opinion, um, it should always, there should always be a sense of uncertainty surrounding forecasts. No forecast is, is, going to, is going to become reality like that, 100% certainty. And so the more we move into some sort of probabilistic sense, the better it is uh, for forecast producers and users in the end. Super, thank you. So there is another question from Manfred Kohler from the Austrian Ministry of the Interior. And he's asking how much international conflict and the potential or the conflict's potential to produce displacement um, is used in forecasting. So he's referring to the Brown University um, paper on displacement caused by the U.S., which shows that wars are a major driver of displacement since 9-11. So I assume this would be more the early warning system, but it would be interesting to get your take. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, so in, in migration forecasting, so-called shocks or events like natural disasters or violent conflict are very hard to forecast, especially with a longer time horizon. So exactly as you said, um, this would be a typical case for an early warning system to come into place. Because there really you can, uh, you can see an event happening and can estimate the consequences of that event into a few weeks into the future. But that remains into a short, it remains a short time horizon in the end. Excellent. Thank you so much. So I think we have um, satisfied all questions uh, of our yeah. attendees. <laughs> I'm very pleased that uh, with this presentation, thank you so much, Rovena, that we're all now kind of on the same page uh, and uh, level of knowledge. And um, I would like to uh, maybe also um, go to the next uh, panel or the next set of presentations. From you, we've really learned that sort of forecasts are quantitative estimates derived more from statistical and econometric models. We also understand that uh, scenario studies produce more the qualitative narratives and provide an array of different storylines or thought experiments of future developments, and that um, early warning system presents this third group, which is a combination of qualitative and quantitative, much more uh, short term. And um, I would now like to introduce three fantastic speakers who will present insights into key findings of recent forecasts and scenario studies, and thus share how these methods have actually been applied in practice. Our first speaker will be Susanne Melde. She's Senior Analyst at the IOM's uh, Global Migration Data Analysis Center in Berlin, and she currently also coordinates um, IOM's Global Migration Data Portal. She will present results of a recent study which looks at immigration scenarios for the European Union in 2030. Next, we will have André Gröger. He's an assistant professor of economics and Juan de la Sierva fellow at the Universidad Autónoma de Barcelona. And his research interests are in applied microeconomics, data science, development, labor, and political economy. 
Andre will present a recent paper where he looks at Google Trends data um, to shed light on how online search data can be used to predict migration. And finally, I have the pleasure to also introduce Jakob Bijak. Uh, Jakob is a professor of statistical demography at the University of Southampton, and he focuses his research on demographic uncertainty, population and migration models and forecasts as well as the demography of armed conflict. He will present re results from a recent paper drafted jointly with Matthias Czajka, who we'll uh, get to know later today, where they look at the critical element of uncertainty in forecasting international migration. So each speaker will uh, present for around 10 minutes. After each presentation, we will have a very brief Q&A session. So this is mainly for clarification questions. So if you do have questions during the talks, please don't hesitate and post them. But we will reserve uh, 20 to 30 minutes uh, at the end of the three presentations for discussion. Um, so feel free to pose your questions whenever you want, and we will continue channeling uh, them like we just did. So without further ado, Susanna, I would hand the word um, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, and welcome also from my side. Uh, it's a great pleasure um, to be invited to speak here at this very uh, impressive conference with an impressive list of speakers. So as um, was mentioned before, it is my pleasure to present to you a, a study my colleagues um, have conducted on immigration scenarios for the European Union in 2030, uh, which will actually be launched today. So I'm really happy uh, to present that, those findings to you. Um, my colleagues Eduardo Ravenna, Jasper George, and Helga, um, some of them are also joining. So if there's any questions afterwards, uh, feel free to ask uh, them as well. So just a kind of background, uh, this study was conducted as part of a uh, EU-funded and EU funded in 2020 project called Cross Migration, uh, which we did together with the Netherlands um, Institute, Interdisciplinary Demographic Institute, uh, MIDI. And uh, yeah, we're just uh, presenting the results uh, today. So what did we um, do in terms of the methodology? Uh, Ravana already mentioned uh, the systematic literature view. Really, she has been uh, leading on and uh, what we did there was to look at different scenario studies that were out there, uh, 21 on European uh, scenarios, and looked at what were considered the most defining issues. And those were uh, the economy and international cooperation to multilateralism. And then uh, the colleagues developed those four uh, scenarios based on their storylines. Uh, so the first one on unilateralism and economic convergence, second on multilateralism and economic convergence. Um, and so on, as you can see there. Those colors will come back when I present the results, but I'll, I'll explain that uh, then a bit more in detail. And so in terms of economic convergence, uh, we were looking at you know, how the EU and origin areas of migrants, such as in Africa, Latin America, and Asia, um, you know, how they would be faring. And so as Ravenna was also mentioning, these scenarios are looking at what if, you know, what happens if a certain uh, driver comes into play. Um, they look at alternative futures, so they um, are kind of mutually uh, exclusive, so that can only be one scenario uh, selected. And um, they look at structural changes and consequences um, for migration. And we combined that with a Delphi survey. Uh, these Delphi surveys uh, look a bit at, um, there's different approaches, but mostly look at how to arrive at consensus among experts um, on numerical estimates on migration flows, um, and you do several rounds to see and you know, to get to uh, an agreement on um, a certain topic. And we combined uh, those quantitative estimates of migration flows with uh, different scenarios on migration drivers and looking at um, their likelihood. So we looked at um, you know the, the uh, third and fourth group uh, that Lorena mentioned in her talk on foresight um, and scenarios. And uh, just a few words on uh, the survey itself. So we looked at the probability of the four scenarios, and then also at some uh, absolute flows on the total inflows to the European Union by 2030, uh, labor, uh, migrants, high use of migrants, irregular flows, and humanitarian flows. We did two rounds um, of the expert uh, yeah, survey, 
um, and had a net sample of about 120, uh, 110 experts, uh, because we only took those with at least five years of experience um, in migration. So here now comes the interesting part, uh, the results. So when we look at the uh, four scenarios that I mentioned, uh, what the experts rated as the least likely, or with 19%, did you see here uh, with four scenarios um, to be equally probable, they have to you know, arrive at about 25%. Um, so you know, we should arrive at 100% with each of those um, probabilities. And the one you see in green, the least likely one, um, is the one on economic convergence and multilateralism. So expert rated that um, you know, international cooperation um, and you know, less economic differences between countries is the least likely. Um, and the other ones, um, in particular, the one, ones on unilateralism, so in blue, uh, together with economic convergence, or in yellow, together with um, economic divergence, uh, they rated as more likely. So that is uh, a bit depressing and not as hopeful, but um, yeah, that's uh, what, what the experts rated. And in terms of um, annual migration inflows, what you can see here on the left is a graph with uh, the black line showing what were the actual flows between 2008 and 2017. The dotted line represents the average over those um, 10 years. And then you can see on the right where um, experts rated you know, in, under which scenarios, what would happen to those inflows. And you can see in red and green, uh, with multilateralism, there will be more movement. Um, and with unilateral approaches, which you can see um, those scenarios in yellow and blue, uh, there would be less movement. But what is quite interesting is that only very, you know, very few uh, cases or very few scenarios, those flows would actually surpass the peak that we saw in 2015 and um, 2016. So flows are expected uh, to increase under all scenarios uh, between 21 and uh, 44%. And uh, what is not pictured, but especially for highly skilled migrants, this is um, expected to increase uh, quite considerably. Now, when we look at uh, asylum applications, I also saw there were a couple of questions in the previous discussion on uh, forced movement. Um, you can see, uh, again, on the left in the graph, the actual uh, figures uh, from uh, 2009 to 2018 with the peak that we saw in 2015 and 2016. And under all of these scenarios, uh, experts expected to um, asylum applications to decrease by 2030. Um, you can see the red and yellow scenarios look at economic divergence. So you can see if there's you know more differences between the EU and other regions of the world. Um, there may be instability in those other regions, and um, so you know, leads to more asylum applications. Um, and under economic convergence, so the green uh, scenarios, you can see that it's there. You know, expected to be in line with the 11-year average, so no increase in asylum applications. And when we look at um, irregular border crossings um, from also over the past uh, 10 years, uh, based on uh, Frontex data, uh, you can see the peak uh, in 2015 and 2016. I'm not going to discuss you know, some of the underlying issues with, with the data. Of course, you know, if there were more border controls, there were also more uh, detections of irregular crossings. But what you can see, interestingly, that under all scenarios, um, not under all scenarios, you can see a great, great difference according to economic differences. So in yellow and uh, red, the scenarios look at economic divergence. Uh, so you can see if there's you know, more differences between um, origin and destination regions, um, experts expected an increase in uh, regular border crossings. And um, the blue and green scenarios, um, they expected, which represent economic convergence and unilateralism. You know, Multilateralism, respectively, they expected a decrease. But what you can also see in the graph on the left is that under all scenarios, experts did not expect to see similar peak as in 2015 and 2016. Now, when we look a bit at the uh, experts' responses, and um, you can see here the, the so-called violence. Um, on in red, you see uh, the first round of the survey with the expert and in blue, the second round. 
The first um, noteworthy aspect there is that uh, experts greatly disagreed on, you know, the flows um, of migrants coming to Europe by 2030. You can see there's a huge variety. In the boxes, um, they represent the black line in the middle of those boxes represents the middle of 50%. So what 50% of the experts uh, responded, and you can see according to uh, the different scenarios, they expect between two to three million uh, people will enter the EU. Uh, by 2030, but there are huge differences. So the larger um, those boxes, the more diverse um, the responses were by experts. Um, so there's large disagreement and uncertainty about what will happen uh, in 10 years. Um, what was quite interesting is with those two rounds, we were also looking at did experts actually change their uh, opinion once they had seen what other experts answered? And um, we can say they did not, only 9% actually revise their um, assessments, so they really uh, stick to their own views, um, even when seeing what others uh, were responding. And they weren't very confident in their own responses. Um, on a scale from zero to 100, they only said um, they would rate their responses about uh, at about 40. So there's um, quite some uncertainty. So you probably ask yourself, well, then why should we look um, you know, at those scenarios? Uh, we've seen uh, experts, uh, you know, are not very sure what will happen, um, how certain migration drivers will uh, pan out. The impact is likely to be ambiguous on you know, the volume, the position, and direction of migration flows. And interestingly, experts don't answer, you know, in a different way than the general population. Um, so, you know, the question is, should we then um, reach out to experts? And I'll come back to that. Um, another of the finding was that the best case scenario for so international cooperation and economic uh, convergence um, integration uh, was rated as least likely by 2030. Um, in terms of uh, the drivers, uh, international cooperation, multilateralism was considered to lead to higher migration, um, which could lead to freedom of movement or uh, freer, um, freer movement, but also working together. Um, and while economic divergence and more differences um, were considered to lead to more irregular migration and driving up asylum applications, but still not as much as uh, during the 2015-2016 peak that we have seen also um, in the data. So that's quite an interesting uh, finding that uh, this crisis or so-called crisis in 2016 was not expected to um, repeat itself or lead to higher numbers overall. I can come back to that in the discussions. So what are some of the policy implications? Um, a bit coming back to what Liz Collette was also alluding to, this is more for uh, strategic long-term thinking, like a, a thought process. Um, we've seen there's quite some disagreement. Experts don't really agree and also didn't really revise their points of view once they saw the other um, experts' responses. Um, but what is useful about this approach is to highlight this uncertainty. It's probably not what a policymaker um, would want, uh, you know, to hear, and rather would prefer to cut responses. Uh, but these drivers, how they will you know, work out, um, depends on a number of factors. So depending also on you know, the own bias and uh, approach of experts, um, there's different approaches you know, depending on who you ask. So there's a value in itself to know, um, you know, that there is this high disagreement, uh, that there is uncertainty, uh, but it's still useful to think about, you know, what are different scenarios, what are different storylines, what could happen if this and that um, um, you know, occurs, um, and, uh, you know, provide input to broader trends, uh, generate a discussion uh, among policymakers about maybe also some of the less likely scenarios that we could have um, mentioned pre-2020 uh, as well. This uh, survey was conducted before uh, COVID-19, but um, you know, there's a scenario that was uh, very you know, unlikely before, but has now um, happened. And so, yeah, looking at the interdependencies that um, different migration drivers um, have. And with that, um, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Susanne. Um, this was really insightful. So I don't think there is a question from the chat. Um, or maybe there is and it hasn't appeared for me, so maybe you can get it. But I wanted to ask you, um, 
maybe you can so so you explained very nicely the methodology and the model but maybe you can sort of give us an example of what this would mean in the real world so what does the world look like uh that is economically um divergent uh with more multilateralism and what does this mean if for example you want to look at migration from africa to europe or something uh i don't know take that as an example what does this mean what does this mean in uh in this sort of exemplary um uh forms mm -hmm. um yeah i mean i think i guess for multilateralism you know the countries work together there's regional uh, integration um not everyone you know, takes their own decisions uh, but really you know, tries to have a, a common um, approach in terms of economic convergence, I mean, those uh, scenarios, of course, in terms of how we visualize them, are simplified. There's a lot of other factors like technology, um, democracy, labor market, inequality, uh, social policy, the environment, but also in you know, a conflict that went into the storylines of those scenarios. Um, but, you know, a bit, uh, beyond the, the time here to explain what that would look like. Uh, but yeah, in terms of economic convergence, uh, shifting wealth so that there's no, you know, not that many or that huge differences that some regions uh, are very well off, others you know, getting uh, poorer and poorer, but there's yeah, uh, more shifting of wealth between different regions. So uh, what we've seen quite interestingly that um, experts seem to look a lot at you know push and pull factors. So if there's you know uh, if there's higher wages or incomes in certain uh, regions like the European Union, uh, that that will attract people uh, to come here. And um, you know, if the differences are not that stark, uh, they wouldn't um, go there, which reflects um, relatively common uh, migration theory. So that's quite interesting to see that you know, the underlying assumptions um, experts are informed by the knowledge we have today and common models. Uh, but maybe, yeah, it is uh, a bit more complicated to think outside the box and what this would mean uh, in 10 years, 20, 30 years. Thank you, Susanne. Um, so there is a question by Jose Ignacio Carrasco, and he's uh, thanking you for the great talk. And his question is that he wants to know whether observed the, the observed large disagreement is due to um, acknowledged uncertainty of the future or to due to a greater amount of methods and forecast approaches. Um, it's probably due to um, a number of factors. One is uncertainty. So, you know, what do we know now uh, you know, about drivers? We think, you know, we have well-established evidence base, but uh, there's not that much um, agreement. People or experts come from different um, backgrounds. Interestingly, one factor that did not play a role, which I should have said, um, or maybe clear for now, is that it didn't really vary across the different backgrounds. So it didn't really matter whether an expert was um, an academic or more from you know, a practitioner uh, background. So it really seemed to be um, more the high level of uncertainty um, that you know, surrounds those, those, um, um, yeah, those, those scenarios. And also, you know, we looked at certain data, but you also need to consider that there's you know, shortcomings in, in all data sets that one needs to take into consideration. I alluded to some um, on regular migration, uh, there's issues there. So if you've looked at migration data, you know that uh, it's not, there's nothing that is 100% reliable. So you're only as good as that data that you use as a basis um, for your assessments. Excellent. Thank you very much, Susanne. So, in the interest of time, I would like to hand the word to André Gröger, who will talk about using online search data to predict migration. Yes, um, thank you so much uh, for having me here. It's my pleasure to uh, share some recent work of ours today. Uh, which is on online search data to predict um, migration. And um, let me just say, so this is going to be uh, have a two parts. So first of all, uh, recent work that we've already published, and um, and I towards the end I'm going to give a, a little outlook on what we're currently working on in a, in a follow-up project um, financed by the Horizon 2020 program. Okay. So 
So let me just remind you as an introduction that whenever we do quantitative migration predictions, uh, what we need uh, in order to train and use these models is, is, is some migration flow data and predictors as we uh, call them, and you can think of those as the typical push and pull factors, right? Um, these may be, for example, GDP in the origin and, and or destination country or demographics, right? So <clears throat> problem being, and I think this has been pointed out a number of times already that often um, there's a lack of migration data. So here uh, uh, specifically, specifically talking about the flows, which is the outcome variable in our prediction model and um, reliable predictors. So these GDP data for uh, demographics to train our prediction model. So um, just to give you an idea, when it comes to migration flows, typically what we use is uh, OECD data. And here, um, just to point out the, the, the lack or the weaknesses of this data is that often this uh, is um, published only with a, with a very decisive lag of up to two years. Then also, um, it is only available, at least officially, at the yearly level. So there's also quite a, a restriction on the frequency. And when it comes to the predictors, then of course, um, thinking about GDP, reliable GDP data in developing countries or, or um, uh, employment uh, statistics is very, very hard to get, um, <clears throat> if anything. So in recent work um, that we have, um, that we have um, published um, is already, uh, is that we use geolocated digital trace data. So specifically here, um, Google Trends. And I'm going to show you uh, a couple of examples just to, to make clear what, what, we, uh, what we're talking about if you may not know the Google Trends engine yet. Um, and we use this uh, data to predict bilateral migration flows. Um, just to give you an idea why Google Trends, uh, you can see that quite impressively here, I would say. Uh, first of all, if you take a look at the left-hand side graph, you see that this has very, very high uh, time variation. So the frequency of this data, and here you can, you can see that uh, we extracted, these are the trends, this is the data of uh, people searching for the term visa in Mexico and starting in 2004, which is the time from which um, these, uh, this data is available. And uh, as you can see, this is, uh, uh, you, can, you can go to a frequency down to the daily level, which is unprecedented in other type of predictors. On the other hand, we also have very nice, um, not complete, but very high coverage. So um, looking around the world, uh, we have data for many countries, including developing countries. Um, and uh, of course, why is Google Trends maybe the right engine to do that? It's because it's the most used, widely used search engine worldwide, right? So whenever um, we talk about Google, um, this represents a market share of 80%, 97% even on mobile devices. So this is uh, quite uh, frequency and, and the coverage has um, provided some very nice advantages to research. And what we're claiming or what we're saying is that this index um, reflects daily search intensities through Google for a given keyword and geographical area. And whenever we choose these keywords correctly or um, in, the, in the migration context, then we, um, we can use it as a proxy for migration intentions. And I want just to give you a, a brief example. So here you see um, the, uh, the, um, go the Google Trends Index um, for the terms immigration and United States in Mexico between 2016 and 17. You can see this very impressive peak here in November 2016. And um, well, uh, just um, uh, what happened there exactly is that Trump got elected. And our um, hypothesis is that Migrants search for information, so relevant information terms that are um, uh, that, that they may uh, uh, reflect information retrieval for um, going to the United States online and prior to departure in their country of origin. And of course, you could say now, well, this could be just reflecting uh, a, a general interest in 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 that uh, uh, in in these terms, which is driven by Trump's election. Uh, but also impressively, if you take a look at the Google at the OECD uh, migration data, you see a peak in arrivals to the United States just uh, shortly after this peak in um, in uh, Google Trends in Google searches for the term immigration in the United States. So um, recent work that has just been published in January this year 
Um, we developed this idea. <clears throat> so um, the article is called Searching for a Better Life, Predicting International Migration with Online Search Keywords, and that's this joint work with Tobias Stör at uh, IFW, uh, who is also uh, presenting in this afternoon session, as a, as, uh, in, the, in the following session. Um, so the, just to give you the summary findings from this article, well, we find that um, the Google Trends have strong predictive performance compared to the typical predictors, say GDP and or uh, uh, population uh, statistics in gravity benchmark models, which are often used to do uh, migration predictions. Um, this, so just to, to kind of uh, give you an interpretation of this, uh, of this article, um, this is a proof of concept. Um, it does not rigorously implement practical forecasting yet, I would say. Um, this is, um, thing, this is um, subject to work that we're currently uh, developing. Um, the promise, however, is that um, using Google Trends to measure migration intentions uh, allows us to do now casting and uh, short-term forecasts, right? So whenever, sorry, whenever I say prediction, I should have said that before, I mean now casting and short-term forecasts. And the terminology may be a little different uh, to what um, we saw in the previous talk, but um, so now casting is basically up to the current period and short-term forecasts are uh, a few months or if any, uh, a, a year ahead of time. Um, uh, in the following slide, I just want to show you a couple of um, graphs that kind of reflect the performance or the predictive power of this data that we're uh, using. Um, and what you see here is the evolution of immigration from Venezuela to Spain. Um, and predictions based on a classical migration flow model and an augmented one. So basically what you see here in, in the bold blue, dark blue line is the total number of immigrants from Venezuela to Spain as reflected by the OECD data, and um, two predictions that are um, based on a benchmark model, which includes GDP and um, demographical uh, indicators at the origin and destination, and using that same model, but adding our Google Trend uh, variables for migration relevant um, keywords. And what you can see is that the dash light blue line here is pretty much um, uh, relatively flat and does not respond very accurately or closely to um, the total number of immigrants, the, the migration flows that you see here. Whereas the dotted line here, the uh, magenta colored one, is relatively closely following um, the evolution of um, the migration flows here. And now predictive, the predictive power basically um, for us, or said, just to say it simply, is um, the degree that this model uh, simulates the um, flow of migrants from Venezuela to Spain here. And in other words, the smaller the deviations between the, the uh, solid line and the dashed or, um, or dotted line, the better the fit of our model and the better the predictive power. <laughs> and by the way, just to point out here, um, you can see clearly the uh, the turnaround in the Spanish economy um, in 2011, 2012, whereas also coinciding uh, with the, uh, the start of the crisis in Venezuela, which led to increases in uh, migration flows towards Spain. And um, this turnaround has also been, uh, has also been predicted uh, relatively nicely by our Google Trends model, I would say. Uh, and of course, this is a bilateral, just one bilateral corridor. You can expand that to other countries and show similar uh, patterns that are um, overall taking, um, giving the impression that, as I said, the classical predictors are relatively, they are slow moving as we know, and they don't have much of predictive power to, um, uh, in these models. Whereas adding Google Trends for migration uh, related keywords does do a much better job, um, as reflected here by the difference in the dashed, uh, the dotted, and the solid line. So, and uh, you can also bring this to the next level and look at corridors, at uh, say an aggregation of corridors here for uh, six origin countries to 35 states of the OECD. Uh, we see uh, similar patterns again. Let me just point out, interestingly, um, that we have. <clears throat> 
Oh, that this also works if you take a look at the um, center um, lower panel uh, for Spain. Um, this also works within the EU. So this is uh, these are flows. I say within the OECD. These are flows representing um, from Spain, originating from Spain, going to the OECD, of course. And um, <clears throat> particularly here uh, for Pakistan, if you take a look at the left lower panel. Uh, you see a lot of turning points, so um, a lot of spikes, and here um, it works particularly well, um, relatively well. Of course, there are arrows in these models still, but uh, the turning points are, are, are nicely captured. So um, let me just give you a brief outlook because I'm running out of time, I think. Um, so next steps, um, as I said, this was a proof of concept study so far that, have, that has uh, provided the groundwork for um, a new project, which is called It Flows, IT Tools and Methods for Managing Migration Flows, financed by Horizon 2020. It's a collaborative project with 40 nodes uh, running, just started this month, basically, so very uh, fresh um, ongoing work, led by um, our university, uh, Universidad Autónoma de Barcelona. And the idea is to do, finally implement uh, these migration uh, forecasting um, techniques using, including uh, digital trace data, using Google Trends, Twitter, etc. Other, of course, here I focused on those. Um, there are other big data sources or other digital trace data we could think of. The policy objective is to improve management capacity of migration flows during different stages of the migration process, such as reception, relocation, and settlement. Um, and let me just point out uh, the last slide here. A couple of challenges that we're facing, of course, again, um, uh, related to data limitations. One, again, is the availability and the frequency of training data, and here particularly the migration flows. So um, we're really are hoping for as much as collaboration as possible at, um, on behalf of the member states of the, Euro uh, the European Union to obtain higher than yearly frequency migration data, which is kind of um, one bottleneck that we're facing. Um, another thing is, of course, the keyword selection. Um, there's a semantic approach, which we followed in previous work that I just pointed out, whereas um, new alternative strategies are crowdsourcing, so say, looking at um, terms in Twitter or other social networks that migrants are effectively using um, to, uh, to include in the, as a keyword. Time horizons, as always, uh, just uh, very neatly following up on the previous talks, now casting, so I um, so predicting up to the current period, which is if you have a lag of two years of migration uh, publishing, uh, migration data publishing, then this may already be very interesting and, and helpful versus uh, short to medium or long-term forecast, right? So um, I think what we're trying to do here is to do um, now casting and short-term uh, forecasts, so up to one year ahead of time. Um, and last but not least, my, taking migration routes into account. So in, in our work so far, we have mostly taken the uh, bilateral view and just looked at the origin versus the destination. Of course, it's not uh, migration or especially refugee migration is not always that simple. And there may be several um, transit countries in, in, in along the routes that also, um, yeah, that also matter and that we will try to take into account here in, that, in this inflow project as well. So um, thank you very much. Um, I hope um, this was interesting and you can have further information here on these uh, sites. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. What a fascinating project. Uh, I'm really intrigued to see how this develops, particularly how it moves from proof of concept uh, to something else. Um, we have one question by Susanna Felker Janssen from DG Home, and she's asking what the margin of error is with the Google search method. Um, so, as I said, uh, when looking at, I think there I need to, I need to differentiate a little bit. So the, what we did so far in the proof of concept, um, I can I can say that the the error margins are much using Google Trends are much lower than um, than just relying on the typical predictors, as I said, something like uh, GDP per capita or and or um, population development in an origin and, and destination. Now, uh, when it comes to to uh, the migration, the implementation of these forecasts 
Um, I cannot I cannot yet say much about the margin of error because um, this project has just started and um, we have not been able to systematically explore that. But um, along the same lines of the proof of concept, I expect this to be um, much superior, um, so including um, digital trace data, much superior to, to the typical prediction models that we're facing. I cannot yet quantify uh, this, I'm sorry for that, but um, uh, stay tuned. So we're gonna, this is something on, on that we're currently working on and we are very um, excited also to explore this more systematically. Super. Then uh, I have one question by Freddy Norma, who's asking which keywords are used in Google Trends to generate the graphs you presented? And another question, um, which is uh, also one that I wanted to ask from, from Dilek Ildiz, what is the time lag between the intention to migrate, so the Google search, mm -hmm. and the actual uh, migration event? Very well. Um, very good question. So. So um, I didn't mention this um, uh, due to time limitations, but so the graphs that I showed you, they're based on Google Trends for um, for 67 different keywords, as far as I remember. So we followed this semantic approach here, and uh, the idea was to use um, terms that are related to migration semantically in, in uh, the Wikipedia encyclopedia. And um, of course, um, we had to kind of uh, limit up the number that, of, of terms that we were using. So um, 67 was kind of a path dependent number. Um, this, um, so this is basically based on, on, on such a large list. Um, then to the second question, um, this is very interesting question because uh, we don't know exactly, of course. So this is also relating to um, potential future research, I would say. Uh, so what is the exact um, lag, time lag between people in the origin country searching and finally, say, leaving that country and arriving somewhere uh, at the destination is, uh, is say, we don't, we don't know yet. Due to time, uh, due to data restrictions that we are facing with the uh, migration flows in the OECD data, um, we were using one lag. So corresponding to one year between search and arrival. Uh, but of course, uh, we would go, we would like to go much finer. Uh, I can imagine that this lag is varies a lot in the function of uh, the bilateral co corridor. So say if we're talking about intra-European um, uh, migration, then this lag will probably be very small, right? So someone can, can just freely decide to migrate somewhere else in, within the EU. However, if we're talking about extra European inter, uh, inter, uh, inter, international migration, then of course this may be a very long process and uh, eventually a lag of more than one year would be the more accurate one, right? So uh, we're currently working on exploring this empirically and uh, understanding well what type of lag is kind of um, predominant in which type of corridors. Super, thank you so much. So there are two more questions, but I would like to park them for now um, in the interest of time and hand over to Jakub Pijak, who will present on dealing with uncertainty in migration forecasting across a range of time horizons. Jakub, over to you. Thank you very much, Julia, uh, and good morning to everyone. Mm -hmm. I'm delighted to, to be able to speak here also as uh, a former IOM staffer who started working on migration forecasting 15 years ago, working, working at IOM Warsaw, so, so it's, it's also a homecoming for me. And this talk will be about uncertainty in migration forecasts across a range of time horizons. And this is this is part of a project that that another Horizon 2020 project, QuantMe, about quantifying migration scenarios that we've also. Uh, recently started, similarly to, to, to the one that Andre has been talking about. So a big shout out to the European Commission. Thanks for funding all these migration related uh, initiatives. And this is a piece of work based on a, on a paper that we produced recently with Matthias Schaika and I'll, I'll, uh, the references will follow uh, in later in the presentation. So to start with, I'd like to proposed to look at migration uncertainty according to the main type. And the, we, we'd like to 
think about two types of uncertainty that draws from the from the uncertainties which are per se, which are one is epistemic, so one is related to the knowledge of uh, of the processes or no, or lack of knowledge of the processes, and this is something that where well, we can we can think that if if uh, there is an area of uncertainty that's related to imperfect knowledge, then it can be helped. You know, some of these unknowns are at least in principle knowable if we do more research and, and try to shed light on that. But there is also a second type, the aleatory or intrinsic uncertainty, which is irreducible. So these are the unknowable, not only unknown, but unknowable unknowns. And this distinction will be crucial in terms of the and what we can say about future migration and also in terms of the policy implications on that. So what can go where? And we, we had a first go at trying to, to approximate the, the division of different types of uncertainty and different factors that come under the, the epistemic and aleatory headers. So the epistemic is everything that has to do with how we define, how we conceptualize migration, how we measure it through whatever imperfect instruments we have at our disposal, and also some things to do with the drivers of migration, with the imperfect, our imperfect knowledge of the drivers and the, the environment and configurations, and finally, the models. So how is migration represented? How are migration decisions, uh, drivers put together in a, in a forecasting model? Then on the other hand, we have the aleatory part. And this is much more, much more tricky. So here we have all the unpredictable shocks, shocks to migration, shocks to migration drivers in the first instance. We also have step changes in data in modeling, and you know the, the arrival of digital traces is is an example of such a step change. You know this, this is something that has appeared quite recently on the horizon. Then we have the unpredictable human behavior, at the especially at the individual level, and then finally. Since we're talking about the future, you know, the future being open, it's fundamentally uncertain. So the, mo the models, the models and methods that Ravenna talked about this, this morning, you know, the, the experts uh, or expert-based methods or survey-based methods or extrapolative uh, approaches or scenario-based scenario ones, and they all have uncertainty hidden in them, in, sometimes in quite different places. So for the experts and for the expert studies and survey-based approaches, what do we know? And this is this follows from the from the discussion the the, 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 the discussion on the chat that we already started uh, when talking about Susanna's presentation. Expert judgment is also uncertain. So if you have a collection of experts, they they will rarely agree on on anything. So so what what comes into the into the the model or comes into the picture is the uncertainty of the expert opinion. Yet another source. Then we have the intentions. You know, the, the, uh, Ravenna mentioned the, the intentions to migrate. Andre's talk also alluded to that in the, in the form of Google searches. The thing is that with, with intentions, they are, they are a necessary but not sufficient conditions for, for migration, right? So, so they do not easily translate to reality. They will translate into reality only for a, for a small fraction of people who form an intention. The thing with extrapolations and early warnings and similar uh, similar methods based on either statistical or econometric modeling is that they they assume some stability of trends at some level, and if they if they use drivers, the drivers themselves are uncertain, and the drivers themselves are very difficult to predict. So so we, we if we are not careful, we can end up trying to predict migration by using drivers which are even you know. Similarly, unpredictable, if not if not worse. And finally, the scenario-based approaches. So we've we've seen examples in in Susanna's talk. The the questions to ask, you know, in terms of the the, the trying to tease out the, the the uncertainty of scenarios and and narratives. Are they imaginative and coherent? Are they you know do they stretch the the, the world of possible futures broadly enough? We can use simulation models, we can use micro simulations uh, to try to, to formalize the, the scenarios, but then they will be data hungry and quite heavily assumption driven. So, so here we introduce yet another source of uncertainty into the mix. And with drivers, I think, you know, Susanna mentioned it, it, it will come later also in, in, the, in the talk by Matthias, you know, the drivers, the drivers are 
many varied and interrelated, and it's sometimes very difficult to tease out what impacts on migration, on any particular migration flow, because it's so, so interrelated. This brings us to the question of prediction horizons. So how far ahead can we make meaningful statements about the future of migration? And in formal terms, in statistical terms, it comes back to the question, the, the, the concept of stationarity or non-stationarity. And many migration, if not most migration processes, exhibit what is called non-stationarity. So, 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 so basically, the, the process is changing on the time. Whenever a shock happens, this brings about a new migration equilibrium, and this happens constantly, which is one of the reasons why it is so difficult to predict migration. And it also means that the uncertainty increases, typically increases with the time horizon, and that has implications for the, for the decision makers. So what we, can, what we can really look at in, across the range of time horizons here is in the very short term, we can, as Ravenna alluded to in her talk, we can, we can make statements that are probably more precise than the longer term ones, and they can be used for operational purposes. So this is the whole idea behind an early warning system. Try to detect changes in patterns, changes in processes as quickly as we, as we can. In the short to mid term, so few, say a few years ahead, you know, still forecasts can be used for, for planning as, as long as they, they, the uncertainty in them is, is uh, somehow acknowledged. But the long term scenarios, the long term visions, the, the, the narratives are crucial for the more you know, high level strategic and, and policy type of considerations. So the, 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 the key challenge now becomes how to choose an appropriate method for the different horizon and for the, for the different asset types. And of course, the two types of uncertainty, the aleatory and epistemic, also have played different roles across these different time horizons. So what I, what I would like to conjecture here is that the, the returns from knowledge diminish. So, so in a sense, the role of the epistemic uncertainty decreases over time, but then the aleatory one, which is related to the complexity of the migration processes, which, which compounds the uncertainty, is increasing very rapidly. So, so you, can, you can sort of almost imagine that they, 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 at the, in the very short horizons, it's the epistemic part that is, that is most crucial. What do we not know now versus in the long run, it is all about the unpredictable things that may happen uh, once we, uh, on, the, on our way from now to the future. And this also maps to the, to the choice of techniques and uh, methods for different for, for different tasks, right? So, so here on this on this stylized example of an of, of an immigration forecast to Germany, you can see how how narrow a horizon for for short term and now casts uh, and early warnings is. Beyond that, what what we are faced with is an ever increasing range of of, of uncertainty, and beyond a few years horizon, we can rely pretty much only on some, some imagine, imaginative scenarios uh, and narratives of the, of the future. So what about the data? What about the data? This is, this is an interesting point because whatever we feed into our model and our, our assumptions and our scenarios is also biased and also bears errors. So this is yet another source of uncertainty we can at least try to approximate it. We can try to measure the errors of in, in, in the data. So, so there have been attempts to produce probabilistic estimates of migration flows. You know, the, the, the IMM project that, that uh, we, we ran at Southampton a few years back is one example. Another is, is uh, a fully probabilistic matrix of flows uh, estimated by John Azos and Adrian Raftery uh, last, last year. And of course, there is, there is now a huge appetite for making the most of the, of the digital traces and other, other big data. They're quite volatile, which means that they're, they're useful in the short horizons, as, as Andre's talk has, has uh, quite convincingly illustrated. But ideally, what we'd like to do is also to couple them with traditional sources, which are better understood because they have been around for longer. But also, this can help us make the most of the relative advantages uh, of different types. So the, the, the timeliness of the digital trace data 
coupled with the appropriate benchmarking that comes from, I don't know, a, a, an established survey or, or a register. So th there, is, there is quite a lot of work to be done in that area. In terms of level, levels of predictability, what we proposed in a, in a piece of work that, that, was, that was published last year in Journal of Forecasting was to, to, to actually look at migration forecasting and migration forecasting uncertainty through the lens of a risk management approach. So to classify different types of migration flows according to the levels of uncertainty they exhibit. And note that in the, in the world of migration, we are nowhere in the, in the area of low uncertainty. So the, the leftmost column is, is, is empty. But that uncertainty being juxtaposed with the level of potential level of societal impact uh, changes in a specific flow might have. So here is, here is a British example. With, with low, medium, and high impact of different, different flows uh, on, the, on the policy area. This was, this was based on the work uh, done for the Migration Advisory Committee from, so from, through, the, through the perspective of the Home Office. But this is, this is something that will be very much user-specific. So depending on the policy question, depending on the user, this matrix may look, may look different. So, so the, from the point of view of someone who works in, in operations and humanitarian relief, uh, the matrix will look completely different than the, the, the one from the perspective of someone who looks at labor markets. <clears throat> this brings me to the, to the question about how to measure predictability. So the, 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 standard, the standard ways of doing that is by looking at, by, by trying to get a handle on the errors, the so-called ex-ante errors, so how large we expect the errors to be given the model that we run. So it's a, it's a statistical property of the model. But also we can look at ex post errors. So once we observe the, the, the reality, we can compare it with our prediction and, and see how the, how the error actually manifested itself in the real life. So having these two pieces of information also can help us tell how well calibrated our models are. So how well do the ex ante and ex post errors align? Is something that we predicted was a 50-50 you know, event over a longer horizon, did it really happen about 50% of the, of, the, of the time? You know, this is the kind of question that we're looking at. And there, there has been quite a lot of work in, in statistics on, on designing so-called score, scoring rules that combine errors and, and calibration. So, so for example, one rule could be to minimize errors that are well calibrated. And this is yet to be propagated into the world of migration forecasting or population forecasting in, in, in more detail. The additional thing to, to, to bear in mind here is that the errors will have different meaning to different users. So for some users, it may be more costly to overestimate. For some users, it may, may be more costly to underestimate future migration. And this is something that we can also bring into the, into the mix by using uh, statistical decision theory and so-called loss functions. There's a, so, so there has been a little work being done in, in, in that area, but not much in practical application. So what are the, what are the options? In the short horizons and for the, for the flows that are somewhat better predictable, the epistemic uncertainty, so the one that, that's related to our imperfect knowledge, tends to dominate. So what we can do here is to look at, at the sort of cost benefit or risk benefit assessment of different possibilities and bring in the decision analysis to help us and help the policymakers and users actually decide between different policy options. But what, what we can look at in, in longer horizons is much more, much more limited because here is the, the aleatory. We are in the realm of the aleatory uncertainty. And here is the place for scenarios which can serve for what if type stress testing for designing contingency plans and uh, going back to today's you know, building capacity and resilience of the of the migration system and migration migration policy. There's of course the question of can we reduce uncertainty in migration forecasting and and with the with the epistemic part the answer the answer is yes but only for the epistemic part. So the aleatory part is, is something that will, will stay there no matter what. And we can, we can think of better data, we can think about better domain knowledge, new research, better judgment. You know, there's, there's, there's a nice, nice book about super forecasting that, that, that shows that you can actually 
uh, improve the, the judgment uh, about the future events slightly uh, by following some uh, some codified principles. But the, the main point is that the aleatory uncertainty will always be there, and it's something to to acknowledge and to manage. So, so th th there are two things here. Depending on what we are talking about, we can either try to to, to help reduce it, or we just have to live with it somehow. The challenge here, of course, is to know which is which. And I'd like to, to finish on the, one of my favorite quotes uh, from, from a British philosopher, Calvert Reed, who said, it's better to be vaguely right than uh, exactly wrong. And with that, I thank you. Thank you very much, Jakub, for this somewhat sobering presentation and the view into reality, which I think is really important. Um, uncertainties are, are such an important driver of, of predictions. Um, I have quite a few questions, but before I pose them, there's also one direct question to you, Jakub, from Manfred Kohler of the Austrian Ministry of Interior. And he would like to know whether you ever looked into social media platforms, uh, which are by now also able to predict behavior, have been used to predict behavior, um, and they might be able to reduce uh, uncertainty, even aleatory uncertainty. Yeah, well, I, I think the, the, it's, it's, a very, it's a very good point, and it it's, sort of goes back to the, to the wider discussion about digital, digital traces. The, Actually, we are looking at, uh, at the, uh, social media data with one of my PhD students, Francesco Rampazza, who is, who is working with, with Facebook data. And but the thing is that, that the, 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 there is an interesting signal coming from these data sources, but it's, it requires some careful treatment. So, so what, you, what you need to be mindful of, that these the, these data are only valid for a subgroup of the of the population, that, that, you know, the, that, the one that uses a particular uh, social medium themselves. And also, that, that we don't know what the data really signify. So, so that there is an, there is a variable on on Facebook that uh, tries to ascertain whether someone is a migrant or not. But this is all, this is all pro proprietary uh, knowledge of Facebook and Facebook algorithms, how this, how this indicator is defined and created. So we do, we do not really know what is being measured. You can, you can follow some sentiment analysis. And, and again, you know, this, I, I can imagine that this will be something that are very useful in the very short, very short horizons, just to pick up some possible changes in the trend. So, so again, we are back in the early warning. Uh, systems type of type of approaches, whether they will be uh, given, especially given the high frequency of these data and volatility, whether they will be much of use in longer time horizons. I think I'm, I'm yet to be convinced. I think at the, at the moment I'm quite skeptical on that, uh, but you know that, that, that's that's definitely something to explore further. Yeah, that's a very, that's a very interesting point. In fact, so uh, we have another question by uh, Milica Grucic. I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing this name correct. Uh, she would like to know what the techniques are to manage aleatory uncertainty. Is this even possible? She asks. Yes. Well, and, and there is there is a there is a whole there, there is a whole literature on actually how to behave in the context of high un un high unpredictability and the, the uh, sort of rampant aleatory uncertainty. So that that the usual that the usual precautions, uh, making sure that we have reserves. That's costly, right? But but if we have spare capacity, we can easily accommodate shock whenever it comes, whatever the shock may be, right? We don't know when, we don't know uh, we don't know what, we don't know how how large, but but we can anticipate that something might happen. You know, COVID nineteen is a case in point, right? This is this is this is something that even though uh, there were warnings about epidemics uh, getting out of control for, for quite a while now. Uh, no one could have reasonably predicted that, that actually in 2020 the, the, the world will be uh, in facing something like, like we are today. So, so reserves, sharing the burden is another thing. So, so it's, it's pooling the, pooling the resources in order to be able to, to, to respond to the challenges of the aleatory uncertainty. And this is, you know, this is a huge role to play for international organizations and, and supranational bodies, such as the European Union, such as the IOM, 
you know, there's, there, there is a, there's a power in, 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 in strength and in, in numbers. We can think about, uh, uh, you know, about, about other things. Uh, if you think about reinsurance business, right? Reinsurance, also the, 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 the business of insuring the insurance against catastrophic uh, risk. This is something that, that can, with, with, with some careful thinking, something similar could be translated into the policy world in the area of migration management. So th there are a few ideas about how to, uh, how to work with aleatory uncertainty. The key point is that we cannot pretend that it doesn't exist. And I think that the pandemic, the pandemic actually helped hammer the point home. So, so now pretty much everyone recognizes uncertainty for what it is. Absolutely, I think that's a, that's a crucial point. We have another question from, from Jasper Tjaden from the IOM Gym Deck, um, and he would like to know whether you've ever looked into prediction markets where experts compete to make the most accurate yeah. predictions, um, and what your opinion is on those. Yeah, so we, we, we looked at them. I think that, you know, prediction markets have quite mixed performance. We looked at them in the context of trying to predict referendum results in, in Britain, so, so we have we had, you know, one on Scottish independence that, that actually the, the, where the prediction markets were quite, quite successful, and then on the on the you know EU membership, the Brexit, in which the, the prediction markets were horribly unsuccessful. And I think in the in the context of, of migration predictions, where because the the the, uh, pre, the prediction markets work based on an assumption of, of basically frictionless information exchange. And, and you know hyper efficiency in in how information spreads. I don't think we are, that this assumption is met in the in the context of migration. And also, if, even if it was, I think that the the best we can hope for with with prediction markets is a short term horizon. So again, early warnings uh, might be worth might be worth having an eye on you know some betting markets. Uh, just to see whether there is any, any you know, some, some uptick that may, may herald a change in trend. Another thing is that to make it work, people would have to bet with real money. So, so, so there have to be some real financial incentives and disincentives for taking part, because otherwise, as a purely academic in exercise, it wouldn't work. So maybe there can be a research grant <laughs> with this idea. Yeah, um, absolutely, yeah. yeah. So, um, I would like to go into the panel discussion uh, right now, and I have um, one question to start, of, start us off, but please, all participants are more than welcome to also ask some general questions to, uh, to all the great speakers we have online with us. So, um, in a recent conversation I had with André Gröger, he said, I haven't met anyone who can predict the future, not even economists. And it really made me laugh. And now, Jakob, you also said it's better to be vaguely right than exactly wrong. Um, and I would like to uh, maybe ask sort of the unaskable. Can we actually predict migration? Should we really be talking about predictions? For me, it would be really interesting to learn um, more about the limits of predictability. So we heard, obviously, about the big issue of uncertainty but also about adequate policy responses, given these limitations. And maybe we can start in reverse order, so uh, maybe Jakub, André, and then Susanne. Thank you. So, I think it, it, it's helpful to, to, to realize that prediction is only the means, not the end. It's, it's, so, it's crucial to start from the, from the policy question. What do we need the prediction for? And this will then this will then guide the choice of methods, the the, the, the choice of the you know possible possible data, and also illuminate the, the, the limitations. So the, the the different types of methods that, that Ravenna mentioned uh, in her talk, and I alluded to, to later on, you know that that maps quite neatly onto the onto the levels of policy making. So you know from the low level operational to the mid level tactical to to, to high level high-level uh, strategic policy aims. And of course, you know, in, in a strict sense, prediction is, is, is impossible, but what we, can, what we can get out of such an exercise is at least some form of an approximation of what the future might like, and then following through to the policy, to the policy uh, question, 
what different policy options might imply under different in different circumstances. So what where it also can help is that the predictions can help us illuminate the trade-offs, the trade-offs between different policy options, different social values that underpin them. You know, the think about the, the the freedom versus security debate that's you know um, currently with, with with COVID pandemic is quite quite heavily uh, featuring. And what we can do with predictions is to to throw everything in the open and be more be more transparent about it as well. So I'll I'll, I'll stop stop here and, and then we can come back to the, the, any follow up. Yes. Um, so thank you. I think uh, Jakob uh, already showed extensively and, and, and very convincingly that there is a trade-off um, between the time horizon and uncertainty. And um, I think this is exactly what you need to talk about. And then, of course, also the policy objective, as you just said. So um, when it comes to yeah, yeah. When it comes to Google, uh, Google Trends and digital trace data, I think um, as we could see, this is something very helpful in the um, current horizon. Um, so with now casting and or uh, with short term predictions, and that's what um, typically has a relatively low um, uncertainty um, band. So this is what I uh, mostly believe in, and or say this is what uh, I. Would uh, would use this data for, and uh, of course, when, once it, once we go to uh, longer time horizons, then I think what I uh, sent to Julia uh, in terms of my statement, uh, I, I would stick to it, and um, and um, especially, I mean, the best example, but I don't want to anticipate too much with the, with uh, Tobias' talk later about COVID, but of course. Uh, as uh, who would have guessed that uh, we are in the situation that we are and we are doing conferences online th these days and instead of meeting in Vienna. And uh, so this is um, precisely limiting um, completely migration, right? And, and there was also a question in the chat about um, whether and how uh, we control uh, for this uh, migration policy or ease of migration. And I, I just answered in the chat as well that we didn't, uh, at least in this uh, recent work, but um, in ongoing work, we will certainly do this. Uh, and I think, yeah, the current situation is the best um, uh, um, situation to show us that this is actually uh, very important, uh, especially nowadays. Thank you. Um, thank you, Julia, um, for the three interesting questions. Uh, a question. Um, I think my yeah, the other panelists have already uh, alluded to a lot of uh, very um, pertinent points. Um, and yeah, the question is maybe not, you know, too much what exactly can we predict, but what can we do with the information we have? So when you look at scenarios, it's really to think about, you know, what are some possible effects? Um, so also to think about not just, uh, you know, the policy field uh, that maybe the policymaker is usually working on, but also interrelatedness, interconnectedness with other policy fields. Uh, what we've seen in many countries, you know, migration is looked at as one field, uh, economic approaches, uh, labor, uh, social issues, they're all kind of looked at in isolation, uh, the environment, climate change, uh, but it's important to look at you know, what would happen if one of those factors changes, if we have political cooperation or not, how does that possibly uh, affect others? So really, um, yeah, thinking about also what are the aspirations uh, of policy and where uh, would we like to go and then maybe, you know, what factors do we have to consider? Um, I know many policy policymakers uh, like to think or, or consider, you know, what's happening now in different regions of the world, where are they, there are you know, more movements being generated, uh, but I think those scenario building exercises can really help us to think about, okay, but uh, in the ideal world, where would we want to go? Where would we want to be in 10, 15, 20 years? And what are you know, some factors uh, that pose more risks um, than others? We know that you know, demographic changes, uh, those are more, you know, very more likely to predict than uh, some other factors. Uh, we don't know what, what is going to happen uh, completely. So there's a, yeah, it's, it can be quite a useful policy tool um, to start that discussion and really yeah, consider some options uh, of of futures um, that could happen. 
even if they are, as we've seen in the talks, uh, considered very unlikely now, they may you know, become a reality uh, next year in real cycle. Thank you so much. So I will um, ask three questions now. Um, you can choose which one you prefer to answer. Uh, we have six minutes left, so please limit your, your response to two minutes. So the first question is one uh, from, from me, which is just what is the policy relevance of now casting? So if it's already happening now, how quickly can policymakers respond? So I would like to uh, see um, understand this a bit better. Then there's another uh, question from Stina Holt from the EMN in Norway. She's asking, could you make some reference to the refugee crisis in 2015? Could Europe have been better prepared with better predictions? And the third question coming from Manfred Kohler, which I think was already um, discussed on the chat, but maybe you want to comment as well, was may um, disagreements among, among experts not also depend on ideological dispositions of, re of researchers themselves. Maybe we can start with Andre, then Susanne, and then Jakub. So uh, I would just go for your first question, I think. And um, I think now casting, um, although <clears throat> uh, it, it happens now and we, we may be able to uh, observe it um, currently, I think it, it, it has uh, a merit, especially when it comes to when, when, think, when thinking about the lag between the departure and the arrival, right? So, um, so this, discovering a signal in migration intentions as reflected by Google Trends in, in a certain uh, uh, origin country, say in, um, in North of Africa or in the Middle East, uh, will certainly not lead to direct increases in um, in uh, refugee Im uh, immigration to the Uni to the uh, United uh, the European Union, sorry, um, since uh, there is typically these migrants do not arrive uh, by plane, but they uh, choose other routes and they take time, right? So exactly by bridging now, casting can help bridging this gap, uh, this time gap between um, departures and arrivals, and therefore it has uh, practical policy relevance for improving preparedness and uh, management of refugee flows, particularly, I would say. Thank you, Andrea, that's very clear. Susanne? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, on the question uh, from the Minister of the Interior on the uh, uh, yeah, ideological background of the experts, I mean, uh, we looked at, you know, whether the regional expertise, the academic background of the years um, of working on migration had a you know, statistically uh, significant effect on how these experts weighted certain scenarios. And we didn't really find anything uh, specific. There was a bit of a difference between um, maybe demographers were a bit more in agreement than um, sociologists and political scientists who were really working more on, on you know, qualitative uh, approaches, but what we really saw is it didn't really matter whether someone was a lot of experience or not was young or, or old, and it was quite useful to see that there's this variety of opinions. And of course, um, which also just, um, others have alluded to, there's you know a lot of underlying bias um, and assumptions uh, that people uh, bring. But we did use quite a large group um, of experts uh, for the uh, survey, so we did you know get a range. Um, of opinions um, on that, but that is, yeah, always uh, a part of it. And um, just quickly to the one question in the, um, in the chat on the, uh, whether the Delphi survey affected uh, the establishment of change of scenarios. Uh, we developed the scenarios first, then the Delphi um, survey, but I think for future approaches, then we would really, uh, take some other aspects more into consideration, like the environment um, or certain crises um, or shocks that we've seen, um, and whether yes, we would affect the scenario. Thank you. So, Jakub, I know I gave you the option to choose the questions, but since your co-panelists dodged uh, the difficult question of the so-called refugee crisis, I would really kindly ask you to touch upon that. Absolutely. And I, actually, I, I think that it goes well together with the one about the relevance of now casting, because the, 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 they, are, the, they, are, they are interlinked. So, could we be better prepared. One way is through, through developing an early warning system that, that could have helped us at least pick up the signal a bit earlier 
So looking at something that changes on a more rapid scale than migration, and, and you know, Google intentions is a prime example, or social media, or, or anything else. But also, you know, that, so, so what, what we could better, do better to respond. That's, that's going back to the previous discussion. We enter into the area of, of you know, politics, political choice, and, and values and will, right? So, so that was that was what was not not really uh, visible in the early days of the of the crisis, and that's that's something that we could definitely do better next time. Uh, and in in the in the sort of broader picture, what what can we do is we can we can still try to reduce the uncertainty in in by by looking at the you know regularities, by looking at different data sources, combining them them them, them together, but in order to manage the next crisis or the crisis after next better, we really need to start thinking more in terms of uh, you know, preparedness, contingency planning, uh, risk, risk mitigation, all these, all, these kind of, uh, all these kind of concepts that are well known to, to the practitioners in the area of migration, but the, the discourse has to move into that into that, that, that direction. So I think I'll, I'll stop here, just noting a small point on the experts and agreeing or disagreeing, even how uncertain migration is, if the experts in the, in the Delphi survey agreed, I'll be worried. Thank you. What a nice way to close this panel. Thank you so much to all of you. What a wonderful way to start this morning. Um, I thought these were really inspiring presentations, very interesting discussions and questions. We will now take a coffee break. Um, please do get your coffee and tea, although we cannot invite you. <laughs> we do hope to see you back at 11.30. We will start, uh, start sharply at 11.30 um, and very much look forward to seeing you back here in 15 minutes. Thank you.